the, the concept of, of being able to see yourself in the other that stands in front of you is really important. I think to, be, to have empathy is really important. To work on empathetic uh, behavior uh, allows you a great deal. I think the capacity to listen and to hear is very important. And then the capacity to be willing to compromise is really important. And I think the capacity to allow yourself to continue to form even, yes, you stand for something, but perhaps, just perhaps, you might want to redefine even more sharply what it is you believe you, you believe and give yourself room to see that. Give yourself room that when you like look into someone else's eyes and you see yourself and see the things that they're saying and you understand that it affects you, give yourself the ability to be able to say, I can. I guess I do see this point. That's a new part of you. But to understand that that new part of you expands you, makes you larger, makes you greater. Ooh. Wow. I think that would be. Was the first time does this yeah. work version was screened in the public, right? Yes. Was it okay? Oh, it's, uh, ah, it's always a very emotional <laughs> moment for a filmmaker. Yeah, my God. Sort of like giving birth, right? I, I, well, I have two kids, but I haven't really pushed them out myself. So, but <laughs> of course, it's yeah, no, but it's it's a uh, it's a it's a job. It's, it's a, a job. Yeah. yeah, it's an emotional job yeah. too at the today's. So it's an astonishing film, and we are so deeply to deeply proud to present it as a special screening tonight, before its world premiere. And your whole career as a filmmaker has been driven by the urge to film transversal thematics. Bananas and Big Boys Gone, bon gone Bananas were dealing with um, the, um, uh, the, the Dole Food Company and the way how we, the, the things we eat um, that are so unhealthy too, but killing also thousands of people on the ground. And then your next film, uh, Bikes Versus Cars, was dealing with the car industry and bicycles too. So what, was the, um, what drove you to tell this story after these films? What was um, the push behind push? <laughs> no, but for me, I mean, first, of, first of all, I'm, I've been working uh, as a filmmaker for 20 years, but I, before that I was also a journalist, and I've been, I've been always writing a lot about cities, I've been interested in city planning, and you know, about the forces who, who make cities look like they are. I mean, bikes versus cars was about city planning, Absolutely. but it's also about Sometimes when we talk about traffic, we think it's like made by nature. It's like a natural development. But I mean, if you come in from the space into the earth and you see the cities where people are sitting in big monsters and they don't come in, they're just waiting for each other, it's like a bit absurd. So for me, it's, it's a lobby-driven development. It's not a natural development. And I think we could take the same look at the cities. Why is it so expensive? Why are we paying so much for our rents than we did before? Why do s governments have less money than they had before and some private companies are almost printing their own money? Is that a natural development or is it a lobby-driven development? Because if we... Sometimes when you listen to people talking about housing, for example, in, in TV or in read about it, they, it's like a re weather report, you know? Yeah. Housing has gone up, it's gone down, it's gone up, blah, blah, blah. It's very abstract. Yeah, but it's, it's not the weather. This is, this is a man-made um, situation. And if it's man-made, you can also, people can change it back. And that's why it's so cool with the, with the shift and it's so, so cool with uh, people like Leilani who are out there trying to to raise the flag. Absolutely, Leilani, that is really a drive in the film, which makes the film so not abstract, I mean, even coming from a seemingly abstract question. So did you meet Leilani when you knew you wanted to do this film, or was it the fact that you heard about Leilani that drove you to make this film? No, I, I had this plan in, uh, this film in plan for a long time before I, I found uh, Leilani. But it's always hard to know how do you tell a story? How do you exactly. make this really complex 
thing. How to I, bring emotion in this kind of topic? Yeah, and I I like I like emotions. <laughs> I think it helps. Uh, but I mean, uh, Leilani. I mean, in my in my previous film, uh, Bike versus Cars, I had a, a Brazilian professor in the film, Raquel Rolnik. A sort of the gatekeeper to the story. Yeah, and she was there like more an expert in the film, but she was actually the predecessor, Leilani, as the special rapporteur. So when she stopped, I actually started to follow the new rapporteur on Twitter. So you're a specialist of special rapporteurs. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I didn't even know that there he had Char some Charismatic ones. special honest, rapporteurs. I didn't know what a special rapporteur was before. I had no clue. Did all of you know that? Well, we're in Geneva, so... Okay, so you're all <laughs> special out there, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's, to be honest, I didn't, I had, I had no clue. Um, yeah, but the, na for the me name it's doesn't really sound very... But when I, but, but, so I was following Leilani for a while, and then I saw a story when she was interviewed in the Vancouver newspaper, and there was something that st struck me of her quotes, that I, wow, this is interesting, we should talk. Then I, we... I wrote to her on Twitter and she actually came back and then we had a Skype. And then I found out that this person could be strong on film. You know, documentary film is also a little bit about casting. You t if you have a boring person on camera, what will the film be? Boring. You know, so it's, it's uh, sorry, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's not fair, but it's, I mean, if you want the film to sit, if you want audience to sit in for 90 minutes, you have to try to make the film interesting. Yeah, if it also, yeah. also works with identifying with the character. You, because Saskia Sassen and Roberto Saviona that you see are very charismatic too, but you cannot really as a viewer, a TV viewer, so directly identify with them. But Leilani is wonderful because anyone can say, oh, yeah. I could be her, we can all act, you know? Yeah. It's also, I mean, there are, there are different things here. It's, first of all, it's uh, uh, the functions in the film that the, uh, the Saskia and Stieglitz and Saviano, they are experts, I would say. Uh, so they are not... Leilani is an expert too. She is, but in the, in the, in the role, she is more the private detective. And that's, that's, uh, that's the role uh, she has in the film. So kind of, so, and it's been, it's been very interesting to work with Leilani because we've actually been almost talking to each other every day for two years. So it and it's been an years? interchange of, of ideas and, and questions because, I mean, I still, I mean, I'm not an expert in hou on housing and, and, and on the financial markets. I'm, I mean, I'm just a filmmaker. So it's, I'm trying to understand things. And, and my take was, if my idea was if I zoom out to a global level, if I, if, because if I do it on the national levels, then you will have all these, the law from 1955, and, the, and it, it, it's so complicated, and it's so boring. And it's, I mean, it's hard, it's a hard story to tell, but when you zoom up, suddenly you see the patterns being repeated. I don't know if you could get, catch it in this film. I mean, people from different places were talking about thugs, I mean, I've, during this work, I've heard stories about thugs moving in, kicking people out from their homes in, in Canada, in US, in, in Korea, in, in Barcelona. So, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's a very violent world right now. When the prices go up, there is the interest of using violence is also is there. Absolutely. So there, is, there are patterns Social being Social violence too, of course. Of course. And, and then I'd never heard the name of Blackstone before I started this project. And only in this, I mean, we will have the world premiere in Copenhagen now in, in two weeks. Blackstone just bought 10,000 apartments in Copenhagen. Um, I was now actually in Greece at a workshop with film distributors from different countries who were going to show the film around Europe. And a guy from Slovenia said, oh, Blackstone just bought a lot of houses in our country, and they tried to buy the biggest bank. So it's it's that the the speed they are moving in. Blackstone didn't own a single apartment in 2011. Right. You know what year is it now? 2019. And now they're the biggest landlord in the U.S., in mm -hmm. Spain, on Ireland, but they're big everywhere. I don't know in Switzerland, but look 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 out. Mm -hmm. 
you know. And they're not the only ones. It's, I mean, it's, they're the biggest ones, but there are, it's the, 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 the same model is there. And it's, they are not a traditional landlord. They are, because a traditional landlord need to, to make money so he can invest them, you know. Mm -hmm. But they can just bring in money. Yeah, absolutely. So they, it's like they're, they're so cash rich. Yeah. It's, it's kind of scary. But speaking about money, was it a difficult film to fund? Who, or did you, I, if, I, if I know well, the la your last films were kick funded too. I know you, we did a, you did a Kickstarter campaign too, so yeah. it was complicated. Um, uh, documentary films are always hard to find. I, absolutely. Uh, it's, Sadly. It's, um, but I mean, we, we managed to fund it, but, it, but it's, um, we're like here. It's, uh, so if you have money somewhere, just you're, please you're send still, us. You're, you're still welcome. You're, you're welcome. still looking for yeah. funding. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and is there an impact strategy? You, you know, the festival is organizing an impact day this year where we're putting together actors of the International Geneva and filmmakers. So we are more and more speaking about these impact strategies. So what's, what's next for the film first? And what can we do in the audience too for the film, but also for, the, for, the, for this topic? Yeah, I mean, impact is that the film should can make some kind of div difference. It's, and, and we are working with strategies with different partners. I mean, in Sweden, we are working with the tenant unions and, and with others. We also try to get more cities to, to sign the shift. Um, in, I mean, in the U.S., we will have a, a big campaign with partners who are going to work a full year on, uh, with a focus on New York. But I think the stories coming out of New York will then be also be able to be copied towards other cities. In Spain, we work with a lot of very strong organizations because it's a, it's a country where, where the, the struggle has been really um, s strong. So, yeah, we, we have a lot of cooking. But, I mean, we, we of course, need more help and uh, to get the film out here in Switzerland, which we don't have any you partners You don't have here. a distributor yet? Not yet. So, and I don't know we, if we will, be hopefully we can get that. But, um, but overall, I mean, if you work for NGOs, if you have friends in other countries, I mean, tell people about the film. We have a Twitter account, Push the Film. We have a Facebook, an Instagram. I mean, help to share and talk about the film. It helps, you know, because we don't have any marketing money. We are not uh, Hollywood, you know, so it's a, so with friends, we all normally get longer, reach, reach longer, you know. I'm sure this film, we have a huge career and we are so proud that it started as a project in Geneva. Thank you so much, Frederick. Thank you very much. I think we'll Thanks. follow on with the debate. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Is that, is that better? Great, thank you. Um, my name's Patrick Butler. I'm, uh, I write on social affairs for The Guardian in London. I'm very proud to be invited out tonight to uh, firstly see the very powerful film and secondly to chair or moderate the discussion we're going to have about um, some of the issues within the film. 
Uh, I want to introduce the, the panel. Well, Leilani, you already know very, very well as a result, and Frederick, of course. I met Leilani and Frederick on a very, very cold day in London about a year ago, and we were looking at um, some, some multi-million pound apartments in regenerated areas of London, and uh, it, it really struck home in the film that, uh, that, that, that this is the same all over the world. Uh, and on our far right, uh, we have Maria Lu Lucia de Pontes. Now, Maria is a Brazilian lawyer and public defender. Uh, she has worked with urban and rural land conflicts since 1999. Two big events that happened in Brazil over the last decade, World Cup 2014, Olympic Games 2016, Maria Lucia was active in fighting against evictions and slum clearances that took place to facilitate those two big global events. Uh, Maria uh, uh, speaks uh, Brazilian, but not English, and she will have a translator, Berta, who is on hand. So when I put these headphones on, that's because uh, we're hearing the translation. Um, I wanted to start um, with Maria. Um, now, you have been an activist in housing uh, for many, many years. What did you make of the film? Good evening to all. The film is fantastic, and I would like to uh, commend the producer, and it's incredible how it showed the uh, current conflict in which we live when housing is seen as a commodity and how this commoditization of life and city has affected people all over the world. Therefore, indeed, uh, this film has Parabéns. had a lot of impact on me. Thank you and congratulations. Um, I wanted to um, talk first about language. Um, I was very struck in the film how, uh, I think at one stage, Saskia Sassen said, um, we haven't yet found, uh, oh, she said, this is not about housing. And now this felt quite odd because you go to a film like this and you think you're talking about housing. This is places where we live and that we have, and it's where our families live and our communities. And I thought Saskia's point that, you know, we, we haven't yet found ways to describe it. Do you feel that this is true, that we haven't yet grasped the scale of the problem because maybe we still think it's about housing when in fact it's about something else? I mean, for me, it's, um, it's very much a language thing and it's also, it's not only the language in that we don't understand what's going on, it's that the, the people with money have invented a new language that we kind of have accepted. We don't understand it. It's so confused. It's so many strange words. We never, we, I mean, we don't, all these financial products, we don't have a clue what it is. So it's, uh, I, and I also think that, and she also said here in the end of the, in the credits that, that we are using the same world words for something that has totally changed. So, for example, gentrification is some, wherever I go in the, in the world, people talk about gentrification. And I, I think that we should stop talking about gentrification. It's a very, it's a very sloppy word. It, and it, it, because when, when you try to use gentrification as this is going on here, gentrification is a natural development. It might be bad, but it's also, it's something that happens every one generation goes out and new comes in. It's, it's, it's natural. What we see here around in the world right now in our cities is a not a natural development. So we could as well call it land grabbing. We could call it something, this is what they do in Africa, you know? We steal people's land. Because we are actually pushing people out of our cities, like you did with the, with the Native Americans once upon a time, for example. Leilani. First of all, I just have to say, I had not seen the film. I saw it 
the same time as you the first time tonight. So I'm actually re in recovery mode. <laughs> um, so uh, on the issue of language, yeah, I mean, uh, I think um, we're starting to find the language and I think the language is financialization. But that is an obfuscating word. I mean, you, it doesn't talk about people, it doesn't, you don't, the word doesn't um, convey the idea of displacement, of pushing out, et cetera, which is why we need this film, um, because the film describes it so um, thoroughly and beautifully, actually. Um, I'm finding in, with the, even within my own movements, like within that right to housing movement, if there is one, um, uh, the, the NGO sector hasn't even caught up with this. Um, I th they're not grappling enough with this issue, and that's within, within um, the sector. So then we need other sectors to get involved and start grappling with it. So I think we're a little behind where these very clever financial folks have, have gone. Um, I find I spend most of my time these days researching finance. That's everything I'm looking at is always about finance. I never thought as a human rights lawyer I would be where I am now, looking, talking to pension funds and uh, trying to understand what is in fact a very complicated um, uh, landscape right now where housing is an asset. I mean, it's. A, I think that the, there was a beautiful moment for me in, of, of clarity in the film. There were many, but there was one um, that's suited for this discussion, which is uh, when Saskia has the voiceover and what we're seeing is an empty um, unit in the UK, I think the Qatari <laughs> uh, unit, and um, she says, you know, it's better if they're empty because then we can change them, sell them, turn them into more assets, but put asset on top of asset. And I mean, I think uh, this is about finance. Um, one thing that really struck me uh, in... Uh, uh, all right, sorry. Uh, what struck me about the film was who this was happening to. And I think it's a, quite a conventional narrative that this kind of thing, land grabs, uh, displacement, happens to poor people to the working class, and that's a narrative we understand. What was striking about this film is this is also happening to the middle classes. Do you think that is significant? It's obviously, in, in it's, uh, that's, that's, why, that's why everybody is talking about this now. It's, this is like the stress of the globe. You, don't, you can't go to any city around the world where people are not talking about housing prices. Mm -hmm. And if you, are, if you are well off, your kids will not be well off. I mean, it's, it's, so it's, even if you are safe, your kids will not be able to live there. I mean, in Knightsbridge, where we filmed, where, where this guy was walking around, where everything is empty, before this was the kids of the lords who lived there. They're also out. You know, so this, this push forces are pushing people out from many different places, you know. So, so even the kids of the lords are, 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 has been moved because of this money coming up from the top. It's kind of absurd. Um, Maria, can I, can I uh, well, I was going to go to Maria, Maria Lucia. This issue of, of who this is affecting now, that it's, it's not just the working class and the poor, is this significant, do you think? Ah, sim. É, isso realmente no filme é muito interessante. O que mostra o que no Brasil as famílias mais pobres the film, because it shows that in Brazil, né, the poorest exemplo, families jogos, um, have understood, especially when we held the Olympics, as the expectations were coming closer e, and closer to uh, those areas uh, which had more value. And unfortunately, a fraction of the society did not understand that this process would not um, hinder only the poor families in Rio de Janeiro, where 22% of the population live in favelas, and that land titling is not very clear. That was the first part of the city which would be affected, but that process would not stop there. 
And of course, for uh, poor families um, in cities like Rio de Janeiro, um, losing their houses is, is something very serious because um, having the right to housing is the first of many rights in a population that does not have right to education, health, and on top of that, um, lose their houses is even more serious. And this is a process that starts with the lower classes and little by little also um, reaches the middle class. But in Rio de Janeiro, this, that was seen as a poor um, issue, not all classes issue. But the movie was very good as it showed how um, the money was um, overcoming a fundamental right, such as the right to housing. And the film uh, also highlighted the fantastic um, work done by Leilani and also to create a new movement. And that was indeed fantastic and the movie really portrayed it very well. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, it, it's interesting that I, I do think that because this is affecting the middle classes, there's some kind of energy around it, especially in, or including from politicians. But as an um, international human rights lawyer, of course my focus is on the most vulnerable. And what I'm seeing at the same time is when there's engagement from governments, they, want to, they might be willing to try to solve that middle class piece. But by solving that middle class piece doesn't necessarily, the solutions, the ideas, the whatever law, it's not necessarily going to be of benefit to the poorest communities. So for me, on the one hand, I'm, I'm happy, <laughs> it's, that's not the right word, but it's, it's good that, that, that because the middle class is so affected, it, this issue's getting energy, but f on a solution side, it's a little problematic for, from a human rights point of view, for sure. Uh, but, but do you think that um, it's often through the middle class, through their anxieties and their stresses, that politicians tend to respond, that, that policy will get made. Yes, but not that would necessarily benefit the poorest people because their circumstances are different. And, you know, for example, uh, one of the big moves that governments have started to make is they're saying, okay, well, okay, we'll start building or ensuring affordable housing is being built, at least in the north and the west, this is being talked about. And when they say that, they'll say, okay, well, 20% of any new builds will be affordable. And then they've reclaimed the word affordable, or they've claimed the word affordable, and they're saying it's like 80% of market uh, rent or value. Well, for a middle class person, they might be able, might, might be able to, to pay 80%, but a poor person obviously can't pay 80% of market value. So it's just an example of a policy that might benefit the middle classes, but certainly won't benefit the poorest households. I mean, w one aspect in the film which is not so much um, is, is that the whole cities as we know them are under threat, the, 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 the culture of cities, which we are normally, I mean, I mean I was this summer in, in Naples, for example, where you still have poor people living in the middle of town. We don't see that so much more. If you go to, to London where you live, I mean, there are people living in the States that are still some, but most people have to commute. And that's like the, now the pattern of the world that poor people are already pushed out of the cities and they have to commute in. So the, there, is, there is the working class is like moving out and in every morning. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's, and that, I mean, this is a very strong movement going on right now. Which, which, is de which totally is destroying our cities. I mean, you're, you can see that, I mean, also in this town, I mean, the, the cinemas are closing, a lot of stuff closes, rents goes up, the coffee gets, everything gets more expensive. You know, it's like it's, it's um, and as this guy in, this baker in Berlin says, they, they put up his rent and they said it was the market. But it, the, the market has no relation to the customers on the street. It's, it's so, it, I mean, normally you will raise the rent because there is so much, you're making so much money from your business. No, no, it's the, the, the value of, of, the, of, the, of the house. You've got a very strong sense in the film 
of, of, um, of the property market, if you like, being totally detached from people's lives, just existing on a sort of different economic plane completely. And clearly that would seem on the face of it to be unsustainable. Did you pick up any evidence on your travels that, that the market on its own was correcting for the fact that no one could afford to live here or no one could afford to rent? I mean, I, I don't know how this will end, but, uh, and I mean, Saskia says, well, this, it, it will go down. Yeah. Um, and, and the Blackstones and, and all these guys, they will probably move out in good time, and then they will leave the shit to the pension funds who are sitting there with overvaluated houses that they probably will stop repair. So you will have a, a lot of new slums coming up, overvaluated houses nobody cares to fix. I mean, it's, I, I, it's, it's not a beautiful future because as she says, it's mining, you know? When they're taking what they, what they need, they, they leave a, a, just a hole. Leilani, do you see any, of, any evidence at all that the correction is coming? Well, in your... Is it on? Yeah. In your uh, city, in London, they've been saying uh, that there has been a correction. And in Melbourne and Sydney, they're saying, in Australia, they're saying there's been a correction. But I um, spend a lot of time reading the Financial Times, and I read the real estate section, and I look at you know property values and all of that. And uh, what they mean by a correction is you know a flat that could have got 25 million pounds in a certain neighborhood like Kensington, Chelsea, now we'll only get 23 you know, million pounds. Like, so if that's the correction we're looking at, to me that's not a, um, a very, um, it's not a correction that's going to benefit people who are at the lowest income. And this issue of mining, I think Saskia Sassen, I mean, she's brilliant in so many ways, but that, um, um, metaphor of mining is so correct because if you once you start digging what you realize these private equity firms do is they have um, some like com computer software that helps them analyze different um, neighborhoods uh, in around the world and right now they have figured out that all parts of Europe have what they call undervalued, and they, you know, I put it in quotes, but undervalued properties. That is, properties that could still be squeezed for more profits for investors. And so they're doing this constant scan, just like you would with mining, looking for gold, right? So they're looking for gold in all of these neighborhoods. And so I don't see it ending because they keep picking up markets where they can make more money. And you can, you can already see it around the big cities where people commute, the price is going up. So it's people commute further and further out. Uh, so the working class will be living on, sleeping on trains. Yeah. There are already, yeah. Uh, Mariel Lucia, um, uh, uh, do you see any signs at all that things are changing, that there is a correction? Olha, é, é, está um pouquinho alto. Está bom? É, primeiro, acho que é difícil corrigir. First of all, I think it's difficult to correct in the financial system that we want more and more. At least in Rio de Janeiro, we play now with the idea that people, that uh, families discuss right to housing as a minimum human right. And once they have this understanding, they need to build protection in their territories so that those territories are reserved for the working class. As I said, in Rio, 22% of the population um, lives in shanty towns. And due to a real estate interest, now there is a new movement pushing the working class away 
from their territories. That's exactly what happened during the World Cup and the Olympic Games. And that's when we started the movement saying that housing was not a commodity, it was a fundamental human right. And people were entitled to their right to housing. And the idea is to ensure that those people continue living um, in their territories. Of course, the film shows situations in which people had already been evicted and that the market had already like uh, taken control of their area. But like they are doing um, in the areas of Berlin, people are recovering um, their uh, houses in order not to lose all the essence of the city, um, such as a place to uh, encounter other people and to exercise their rights. Their, their rights. And it's very important, and, and the film shows it very well. And I think we needed to focus on a work um, such as discussing uh, the right to housing as a human, human right and not giving away our houses to these financial companies. They are buying houses uh, 10 times, and they are speculating, uh, selling the houses amongst themselves. And in the end, houses are not used for a living, but only for profit. Therefore, I cannot see right now how to um, get it right, at least in Brazil, that's something that is not uh, foreseeable right now. Therefore, as we live in a global world, we need to uh, think of other ideas as well. It's not going to correct itself. Um, ben, where do we think that, and that the consequences are being felt by ordinary people? What, where, what do we think the consequences will be, and, and where will the resistance begin? Who is it that it's going to resist, and what will they do? How will they resist? I mean, it, it's um, in in cities around the world. Young people are out protesting. You see that in Germany a lot right now, but also, I think in, it was also now in in Slovenia. I mean, it's it's countries around the world. In Spain, it's a big thing. Uh, so I, I think it you will see it in that kind of protest form, but it's also. Uh, mayors from parties that have like voters from normal people, they're also under stress. Ali, we're talking about the social democrats and so on. They're under stress because they're actually, their voters are moving out from the cities, you know. So it's, it's um, I mean, that will also be a problem for London. You know, Sadiq Khan has now, he's now the mayor, but if all, if all labor voters are forced out, <laughs> so it's, so for the politicians, it's actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, they have to do something. And, and I'm, I'm, I, they feel the stress. They, f they totally feel the stress. But they are really late on it, you know. They, they lost so many years of market solutions. They all believe that the market will, will in one way, that the magic of the market would, would save everything. And it didn't happen. So it's so now they're all shit, and we have no money, because the the, the unbalance. Because as they be, the the hedge fund been able to print money themselves, the cities only have the tax money. So they, it's like they're man, they're mu it's mu they're much more unequal than ever, which is also a very strange situation. Sorry. Yeah, I might add to that. I mean, the idea of the shift um, was that we know there are people resisting. We saw the women in the park in Chile and Valparaiso, and um, we know from around the world there are um, people, but not just social movements resisting, but lots of different actors. So, you know, that's the idea of the shift, is to go after all the stakeholders. So we know there are some cities and mayors who are resisting and saying, this is unsustainable in my city. We know there are lawyers doing the same thing, litigating, doing strategic litigation. We know there are social movements. I've recently been, been in conversation with um, national human rights institutions who are saying, we have a role to play in this. Two, I, I've engaged, I'm starting to engage and try to look for um, 
progressive private equity firms, believe it or not, there are some out there. Um, there's a fair B and B movement in Canada, for example. So, but the problem is, at least from my perspective, is that this is all happening in these like little piecemeal ways, and there's no nothing to show that we are actually a global movement. And that's the idea of the shift: is to show all of the work under one umbrella that there are. A, you know, a million shifters around the world just as strong as Blackstone. I mean, it struck, it struck me in the film that a lot of the political, organized political resistance or established political resistance was local. So it's coming from cities. Now, lots of cities, London included, there is not really that much power invested in the mayor to do something. To what extent do you think the established national political parties uh, have grasped this yeah. issue. <laughs> it's, I mean, <laughs> I think this is the language thing that I've started to talk about before. Uh, the language that, that the national politicians are stuck with is the language constructed by lobbyists and their think tanks. So they, as soon as the national politician is have talking points that goes away from the talking points from the lobbyists, he will get a shitstorm through media and through the other parties. It's, so it's very hard to go against these kind of goods from the think tanks and, and they're the lobbyists. And I think the only, and that's my hope with, with the film and with the shift and so it's actually to, to be able to, to, to create this counter language. I think even the word push is something that I found around the world. People are talking about it. it I think that's a valid word in this, in, I mean, the, the push forces. So I think it's, so to be able to move the national government, you need to, you need a very strong movement. And that movement is, is also partly built now by mayors because the, the mayors are under bigger stress than the national governments. Wow. I mean, how do we think this all happened? Was national governments m making laws and policies that enable financialization? And if you think about something like pension funds, pension funds are hugely important to the economy of a nation. So any government that wants to sort of steer pension fund in a certain way is going to obviously do so with temerity, with a timidness, because the pen pension funds are so um, important to the functioning of an economy, so is housing and this uh, kind of, you know, uber luxury development, et cetera. If you look at, start looking at, you know, what makes up the GDP of a country, and you'll find that this kind of housing, not housing for the people, but this kind of uber luxury housing and, and construction that goes with it is a huge part of economies. So if we're going to tackle it, we're asking governments to go against the structures that they themselves have created. So it's tough. I mean, there, it's tough. But I'm interested to know uh, what your new uh, president... Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I'm interested to know, you know, I mean, he's part of this, right? Could you ever change his mind? No. I mean, these are, this is the problem we're up against. Uh, então, olha, é, como a gente estava falando, essa coisa, esse trabalho de, de this work of defending the right to housing and taking it as a human right, and also uh, what they have mentioned about legislation is very correct. In Brazil, we have a very protective uh, legislation which is underpinned by the social movement, and it's contained. Uh, both in our constitution and also in a municipal legislation. We have a prohibition of um, eviction in certain communities, but the market has um, strong power over the markets. And also the pressure of markets over government is very strong. 
que o filme também mostra, na verdade, the film os interesses shows it very well. In fact, economic interests are global. Companies are all over the world. We do not know um, which company is purchasing the houses, um, who is building all, all, all these constructions. Unfortunately, we have, uh, we have had a change in our legislation, which shows that they um, attempt to avoid people having their um, human rights, and it uh, prevents Brazil, it prevents, um, Brazil from being seen as a country that moves forward, a country that is open to protect its people. Now, the new president is um, showcasing Brazil as a country easy for business, and it's now opening up and providing a sort of violation to the environmental laws. And it's important to understand that it, this movement belongs to the world, and it will um, be present in all countries in the world. And of course, probably the state of Rio, we suffer more, but it's important that all individual is aware of their rights, because I think that it's how this movement will become stronger and stronger. And as Patrick said, or rather Frederick said, that this is something that is becoming natural in the market. Violating rights is something that is becoming natural. And this is exactly what the financial sector wants. Therefore, unfortunately, I do not see a positive outlook. But that said, I believe that through our governization, through our work, we will um, have better results, such as, like it happened in Rio, we had a mass movement of evictions, but we could fight it. And although we now see a difficult period in Brazil, I am sure that we'll see um, the way through it. And the movement I see here, it gives, gives me energy because I do not think this movement will remain local. That will be a global movement and we need to be connected. It cannot be an isolated case and that's not an isolated case. And this is something very good. Can I just add one thing? I mean, if we're talking about, I, I think the solution is political. And, and if we know, somebody told me that 50% of all money on the world stock markets are pension funds, pension fund money. So it's a lot of money. And, and as Joseph Stiglitz says, you, you, you can actually change the fiduciary frameworks of the, of the funds. And there is a very strong movement. Now, we, we talk about divest oil divest coal. I mean, the Church of England, the Church of Sweden, many churches since long has divested uh, weapons, for example. So, you, I mean, you, you can, if you can make, you can, I mean, every union can actually bring it up in their own pension fund uh, that they, you should change the, the frameworks where you can invest the money and then you shouldn't invest in climate change or in in making, kicking out pensioners from their house. Well, I, I'm struck that in, in Brazil, Brazil has elected a president, sorry, Brazil has elected a president who is actively saying he's probably, well, we know he's gonna make things worse for the people who are feeling or suffering all these problems. There's a paradox here. It's a paradox. It comes and goes, and, and hopefully Brazil will have a better president next time. I mean, I mean, this is like this is this is the time we live in right now. I think the the movements and the cities, because in in I mean the cities still have, to, I mean in in London you don't have to, I mean in London you don't have the same government as you have in the national government. So it, I think the the cities are, are maybe have to be the leaders in this this struggle. If I, I guess what I would add is, uh, to me, this is where um, international human rights law comes in, because 
what's good about international human rights law and, and what it really is about is accountability. It's an accountability mechanism for states. And so ideally we could bring human rights law to bear on states and, and try to get states to meet their human rights obligations by regulating and, and creating new fiduciary um, obligations, et cetera, of pension funds, for example, or by changing, like, I, you know, s some people are, star academics are starting to talk about whether it's possible to limit how many units a single owner can have, like Blackstone. How many can they, shouldn't we cap it? Can they have, so there are th ideas out there, but we need a mechanism to hold states accountable to get states to do what they should be mm -hmm. doing. And for me, that is international human rights law because it doesn't come and go with governments or you know newly elected governments. It well, I, I suppose what I always worry about human rights law is that I never see the challenge. Where, where will the challenge come? Where will the human rights law challenge come? Will it be at local level? Will it be at a government level? Well, <laughs> I mean, that's part of the role of a rapporteur. So, I mean, when I, the mission to Chile and, and, and Korea were opportunities for me to sit down with government as well as civil society, of course, and talk about what the government's human rights obligations are, and I issue a set of recommendations, and then I try to work with the government, if they're willing to, to implement those recommendations. But there are other mechanisms within the UN human rights system where governments actually have to appear before UN human rights committees, and those committees are um, able to, again, you know, put some pressure on governments to do what they're supposed to be doing under international human rights law. Part of the problem with this area is the human rights community is only coming to it now. And so there is a committee that's responsible for trying to get states to do what they should with the right to housing. And they've recently started to, to try to hammer states on financialization, but only in the last, well, really since we started working together and we started to make some noise. But it's also about, it's about tax, it's about tax policy, it's about regulation, it's about planning, it's about a whole load of things, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I mean, the tax havens is one thing then, for yeah. example. London is the biggest tax haven in the world, said Saviano, it's not, not in the film, but I mean, it's, so I mean, you could start. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I mean, of course, all these, all these, this uh, criminal money that goes together with the tax evasive money mm -hmm. that also comes in and destroys our cities. Can you, can you block that flow a bit? It will make a hell of a difference. There was a really interesting scene in Kreuzberg uh, where you had, um, you had the restaurateur who was very cynical. I think his words were, the train has left. There's nothing you can do. And you had the local politician who was saying, we're able to buy our properties. Um, you, know, we're, we're, you know, we're going for it. We, we've spent 40 million euros. I mean, there was two views there. On balance, are you optimistic? Uh, which side of the fence are you? Or, or do you see both? I mean, I, I, that's my nature. I want to be an optimist because it's more fun to be an optimist than being pessimist. I think pessimists have less fun. <laughs> So <laughs> that's my, that's like how, to, how I try to live my life. But of course, it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's a challenge. But I, I, I believe that people can change things. And, uh, and, and what started up now is, gives us a lot of hope. Also because um, sometimes when I did this film, Bike Versus Cars, you know, people have been killed on their bicycles forever. It's been really dangerous to go on bikes. But suddenly, a lot of people started to bike. And in London, for example, suddenly it's not only poor people who are on bikes, it's also middle class, lawyers, journalists. And when they get killed on the streets, the police moves, the legislation moves much quicker. So I think when now the middle class and the upper middle class are hit by this phenomena, it will be, it's, grow, it's, it's coming to be the biggest political issue. And it's, it's there everywhere. And of course, this, this big issue is still lacking some kind of language, and I think that's what we, all of us, is, should be part of to, to change it. And then I think change can come. Will it will not be easy, of course, but it will be fun. <laughs> uh, Maria Lucia, uh, 
at the end of the day, are you an optimist here? Do you think change is coming? Yes, I'm totally optimist. And I think every person has a fundamental role in fighting for their rights. But it's important to uh, know where we are so that we can then like file complaints and, and have dialogues. And I think this is part of being an optimist. Of course, there are basic needs that the system will not be able to meet all of them. People need housing. And I think the most important thing that the film features, especially for us um, that work on defending housing as a human right is to point the finger to the problem. The, the, the film shows that there is a problem when we are um, using housing as a commodity and not as a right. I am very optimistic and I believe in the capacity of human being to build beautiful and good things. Of course, it's not easy if we have an entire lobby and financial system. It's hard. And now back to your question, how Brazil could elect someone such as our new president. This is part of the lobby. There are uh, many rhetoric that uh, makes us feel afraid and want to make us a step backward, but we are not. I am very um, optimistic, and I think we have all the possibilities to build something better. Otherwise, we would not be here today. We have gone through many things. Humankind um, has been through many difficult things, and we need to face it up. We need to um, face it up and fight against uh, housing as something aimed for, proper, for profit. We need to understand that housing is a human right that needs to be preserved. It cannot be used for business. And also, um, the issue of pension funds is very interesting because those are people that invest their money, and also we need to see how those pension funds are contributing to gentrification for taking houses away from people. And I think it's important to, to mention that because that, that can touch on people's hearts. I wondered if that, that, that scene was meant to suggest that you know, perhaps we shouldn't be too optimistic, that there's a sort of... Well, he claimed he's an optimist and he made the film, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, whatever. I'm an optimist despite that scene. Um, uh, yeah, I am an optimist. I mean, what, first of all, we're on an unsustainable path. Something has to be done. It's uns what is happening now is unsustainable. One thing I wanted to mention th that, of course, the film the film can't cover everything, of course. But you know the scene where I'm looking at this graph and you see, uh, you know, the the cost of housing in Toronto rising like this and incomes like this. You know, uh, that graph is true the world over, and in fact, it's worse in the global south than it is in the global north. So in the global south, it looks like this and like stagnating. So, so that being said, I am optimistic because it's, uh, this is unsustainable, one. Two, well, I'm a sore loser. So <laughs> we're not, I'm not gonna lose this one, no way. So. <laughs> uh, at this stage, I was going to ask the audience whether they would like to ask some questions. Um, and I, uh, I actually, it's really difficult to see. Uh, that's better, that's better, we've got some light, great. And do we need microphones? Yes. 
Yes, I think we do. Um, okay, I'm going to go to uh, the lady at the front with the red top. Um, if, you, uh, if you could say who you are, um, okay. that would be great. Uh, thank you so much for your great discussions and movies. It's exactly fantastic, and I really appreciate Frederick and then everybody is, you know, involved in developing this um, great movie. And then um, my question, is, so I, I took all the story really personal, because like now I'm working for human rights, including the rights to housing, and then I used to be working in a human finance, also like a struggling to live in New York as a student. So my question is, after 2008, like a big financial shock, there, you know, there was a big criticism on the financial sector and the private sector involved in that, um, like a big wave. Um, but it seems like it doesn't really change, you know, get changed after 2008. Like, you know, they're older. Um, so like my question is, um, 2008, like a big financial shock and then like a surge of discussion of um, asking the private sector to be accountable, um, is including a business and human rights discussions. Uh, what do you think about like impact of those, you know, those issues? Um, and also like, sorry for, you know, asking big questions, but and I was really, I'm really concerned about the sort of like a gap between like rich and poor, not only in terms of money, but also like knowledge and, you know, like a sort of, um, knowledge, like it, the financial sector is getting more and more complicated. So it's really difficult for, you know, those like are, uh, those people in a vulnerable situation get understand, you know, what the situation, you know, they're, you know, they're in. So um, what, what do you think about, you know, we can sort of correct those kind of gap of inner knowledge and, and you know, rebuild the sort of connection between people? Um, well the, the, the financial crash was a lost opportunity, was it not? I mean, we had that opportunity for you to, us to have the discussion with finance and human rights and so on, but we, we missed it, didn't we? It, I, I, for me, it's, uh, it's the, the financial sector has been great in crisis management. They hire PR companies to, to handle their crisis, how to package it. And they sold it in a way that w was really good for them. That's what Stiglitz says, you know. They, they, they saved the bank and they kicked out the house owners and they gave the money to the hedge funds. And, and, and meanwhile, we were talking about Greece being irresponsible. We were talking about Spain being irresponsible. Greece was the big issue, remember? It was the Greeks who actually was about to take down the whole shit. You know, and but it's, and then we forgot about these guys. You know, sorry, not you. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, to understand what happened, what's happening now, you have to understand 08. The global financial crisis facilitated this. It made it happen. It was because there were so many foreclosed mortgages that Blackstone got the idea of creating this new asset class called single family residences. And so, in fact, no, it's, it's worse than we think. It's not just that it was a lost opportunity. It was used to create this mess that we're in. And on the issue of knowledge, I, I actually contest the idea that you know, these rich financial actors have this knowledge and the everyday people, poor people don't. I have never met a person who's low income or living in homelessness or living in an informal settlement without access to water, et cetera. I have never met a person in dire housing circumstances who did not know what their human rights are. They don't use that language, but they know that they are suffering a lack of dignity and they know that that's wrong, especially, I mean, even worse in affluent countries. And so they have a very precise knowledge of what's going on in the world. They just use a different language. Maria Lucia, do you want to uh, come in on that? Yeah. No, essa crise, na verdade, é, 
É isso, né? Ela na verdade mostrou The crisis showed how the financial system regulation is not able to meet the needs of people in terms of housing. Those who analyzed the uh, 08 crisis thought that the system would um, explode. But the truth is that the crisis uh, generate, generates more income. They can take profit out of the crisis. But I think it's um, in the hands of the civil society to challenge it. Because if we wait for the financial system to change it, it will never happen. The pressure should come from the civil society and also from governments to better regulate the financial system. Of course, it's not an easy road. If it were easy, we would have already changed it. But it's important to understand the problem in order to um, face it up. Yes, the gentleman in the green chat. Hey, hey, thanks for the film and uh, all the great work you're doing. Um, the, the shift project you're doing, you know, there's projects out there where communities are gathering up and buying property off the market and then making it part of like a community good or creating greater social commons. Like I think in Germany, there's a big project where they bought like a thousand dwellings and it's owned by this community. Um, why did you omit those kind of projects in the film. And um, I mean, maybe there wasn't enough time, but, um, and is, is that potentially, you know, some regulation around making it easier for those community kind of projects to organize? Do you see that as part of the cure as well and this challenge? Uh, it might totally be part of the cure. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I think we have to be on innovative to, to change the world, to be creative, and that's part of it. For me, the film, I mean, to, to make a film that makes us see this, this, this situation from a new perspective, that was my ambition. So I wasn't so focused about solutions. Normally solutions get very technical, it's very hard to tell them in film, and it, it will be very heavy, a very long film, add a few hours more. Would you sit there still? No. Or, I mean, I think you have to make sp special films about these uh, ideas, and I, they are totally worth the film, so just go for it. <laughs> Leilani, is that, is, is that the solution? I think there, it's important. Community land trusts and that sort of thing, I think it's important. I don't think it's the solution. There isn't a, a silver bullet, excuse the expression here. Um, I think there's some really interesting things happening at that grassroots level. Uh, but the only thing with community land trust is you have to remember that 217 trillion that um, Saskia mentions, which is the global value of, of all real estate in the world, residential real estate is, is valued at 163 trillion. Um, that's a, a shitload of money. These are big players. I mean, Private equity firms, Frederick's already said it, private equity firms can snatch up property like that. It's not just that they have an, uh, an abundance of capital, it's liquid capital, and they're getting it from banks. Deutsche Bank is, is one of the big ones, for example. So, so, you know, you have a small community that's trying to buy some land. Think about how hard that is in the face of a, a private equity firm snatching up properties. I do think these are important movements, though, because they're a pushback. I'm going to take some more questions. There was a lady on the right there. Thank you very much, Hélène Pour, ancienne fonctionnaire internationale, international civil servant. And, uh, I didn't have time to buy watches while I was at work. I can tell you that. Trois toutes petites choses en français, enfin dans la langue française. Just a couple of things I'd like to say in French. Soyons réalistes might say, tentons well, let's be optimistic, Ça, let's une attempt the impossible. La deuxième chose, it's just a suggestion uh, that you might like to take into account. The second thing I'd like to say is that I was a little bit uh, disturbed um, watching this film because I've been working naïveté. in international organizations and I was a little bit struck with naivety in the film. 
I have the following question. Western governments seem to be trying to attract investors uh, however they can. And how can you actually um, do anything to stop that from happening? And then finally, why not set up a sort of uh, tenants, international tenants association and uh, we would be far more numerous than the investors, if you think about it in those terms. I, I think the word was naivety there. Was, do you think that, 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 that it's naive to believe that we um, can stop this inevitable role of cash and investment? I, I like to be naive. I think we all should be naive. I think that's, it's a good thing. That's, that's a good thing with children. They are naive and they still think are, are possible. So, so I don't mind being naive. It's Ma not, maybe not an answer, but uh, yeah. that's a short one. Uh, Marianne Lucia, uh, are we naive? I mean, there are countries that are trying to, to, to stop it. New Zealand, for example, did it recently. So they are now stopping foreign investment in housing. So that's, that's with a new government in New Zealand. It happened last year. Was it this year? Last year. Well, so it's, uh, so it, it can happen. And then, of course, all these legislation have their own problems. But it's, it's, the politician can do things. I mean, Leilani, in your, your report last year, you mentioned one or two uh, places where there has been progress. Yeah. One or two you could mention that we, we, we could yeah. take heart from. Yeah, I mean, Singapore is the, you know, example that most people point their fingers at, but I think New Zealand is now um, an interesting example. Uh, you may be surprised to know that New Zealand has had one of the hottest housing markets, uh, real estate markets uh, in the world. Uh, and the new prime minister, uh, the only prime minister to mention, the only world leader to mention at the recent um, World Economic Forum, housing and well-being as uh, fundamental for states to, to think about. Um, but, you know, Singapore has had, um, the thing is they've been doing it for 50 years or more than 50 years, but they have had a very high, high tax rate on investment in property. Um, and you get dinged uh, through taxes if you sell property after one year or after two years. So there are, there are things uh, like that. Um, and I think through regulation, you could actually curb, um, uh, it's not just foreign investment, we have to be careful about that, but I think you could curb this investment. I mean, the, it's just that so many opposite things are, are happening. I mean, there's a, there's a whole thing called golden visa pro programs, where if you purchase property above a certain amount, you get basically a visa to live in, let's say, you know, Europe. You can travel throughout Europe. In some Cyprus, cases, Cyprus, Malta, yeah. uh, Portugal. Portugal. Basically, uh, also London, I would say. Yeah, I think Greece has it. I think Spain. Yeah. No, maybe not Spain. But in any of... Oh, Spain has it. But uh, you could just not have those laws, you know? Just make that impossible. Um, I'm going to get some more questions. There was a gentleman... Uh, uh, yes, yeah, standing. That's the guy. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Milun Kothari, a housing activist from New Delhi. Um, I had two... Um, Two questions. One is um, congratulations on the film. Um, I, I wanted to ask why the focus was only on the financial big mega sector. I, mean, I live in a city in Delhi where we don't have Blackstone, we don't have very little Airbnb, but we have a colossal housing crisis. So even if you could get to these guys, that's not necessarily going to solve the global housing crisis. And I, I just wanted a response to that. And second, uh, Leilani, I just wanted to ask you, it's great this work with the shift, but do you see the mayors that have signed doing anything to control speculation? And I'd, I'd like, I mean, the mayor of Geneva is not here, but I'd like to know what he's going to do for Geneva. You know? uh, Leilani, if you take the, the second question, I think, I think just for in terms of time, yes, yes. the mayors, are they doing anything? 
Well, the way the shift works is that they are required to do something. So we never wanted the shift to be about ribbon cutting. That would not be of interest to me, as you can well imagine. Um, so the pledge that the mayor signed says that he's committing uh, to take some action. And UCLG, the United Cities and Local Government, one of the partners in the shift, is working with cities. Um, they've developed um, a Cities for Housing declaration. That declaration pinpoints four areas that cities must work on as part of this shift, and it includes trying to curb this investment. And the next step will be to develop um, action plans in that regard. And I'm, of course, assuming those action plans will be human rights based. Uh, but of course time will tell. But it's a staged process and it's not gonna happen overnight. But the expectation is action. Okay, I'm gonna take three questions. If you could keep the questions quite brief. So, sorry. Uh, gentle, uh, a lady at the front in, in the red, gentleman over there uh, with the brown jumper. Um, and the G gentlemen, right at the back as well. The, the, if I may, sorry. It's, it's Three. It's no, no, just um, the, to answer the question of the gentleman and to build on what uh, Leilani just said. The, the idea of signing the shift tonight was also to be able to see next year what has been done in Geneva. So the idea of the festival is also at some point to help to hold accountable the, at least the, the people in Geneva for having signed this and see what will happen come back. during the next year. Mm -hmm. So you're definitely welcome to come back because that's exactly the idea is that we actually want to, because it's in the Geneva constitution, it has been written down, and, but nothing has been really implemented. So that's something we would like to actually look forward to. Thank you, Karen. Sorry for the hijacking. That's okay. Three quick questions. No, no mic. There's no. Mic, 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 mic. Sorry. Good evening. First, of, my name is Frederica Nautier. I'm the director of the Human Rights Cities Network. First of all, I would like to thank for. I think it's fantastic, and I would like to commend the work, because. What is essential, as it has been said, it has, first of all, everybody has a role to play to promote human rights. And what I see which is essential here, it's not only raising an essential question, but mainly to give access to information. And what I found extremely important in that movie is that the problem of human rights is translated and accessible to anyone and of course, the poorest has a role to play, and they need to understand what is the issue. Everybody needs to understand. This is a question of awareness raising and information. So my question is, what are you planning to do to promote and to give the access freely of this information to the people who are concerned? Because as you said, Frederic, it's also the culture of a city which is in danger, which is threatened. So what, what are the next steps to make the actor, the one who are the, the, the people concerned, to become actors of their own life and their own right, to give them their rights in their hand, giving them that information which shouldn't stay only here. Okay, thank you. And the second question, gentlemen, in the middle. Oui, bonsoir. Merci pour ce beau film. Donc, je suis Good evening. Thank you very much for this beautiful film. I'm the president of Geneva, an uh, organization called uh, Citizens for Public Justice. I have also work uh, in real estate. I was absolutely disgusted uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, was a uh, money laundering in Geneva, which has resulted in an increase in prices. Uh, just a note: for, uh, fortunately, the Swiss government sometimes reacts and. And when there was the great um, uh, land crisis, uh, real estate crisis in 1999, 89 and 92, 91, uh, this crisis then continued. And precisely just like Singapore, it was forbidden 
it was made illegal or will not quiet, but if you bought the property and sold it a year later, the state would um, well, take tax you by 50%. So it is a regulation, but it's not enough. I think we must change the uh, political economical system. We have a model which we call neoliberalist, but people do not know what that means. But I wonder but I wonder if you agree uh, that we must change the political economical model, which I call deregulated liberal capitalism. Are you ready to change it for another system in which people's power will be power over financial means and ca financial capitalism? I'm ready. And, uh, okay, one last question. <coughs> yeah, um, it's for, for the rep reporter. Uh, that, that I mean, I was thinking that the needed that the rep the reporter of the United Nations you need to make a movement. The call shifts that I found like <coughs> really well, but that shows something about the United Nations. Why the reporter of the United Nations need to make a movement? They call shit, shift, you know? Uh, je pourrais répéter la question en français? Le fait, le fait que la the fact that you, as a special rapporteur for the United Nations, have the right to using, and yet, despite having that role, the fact that you have the need to create a movement called Shift, this shows something, tells something of the United Nations. Do you understand my question? Just to conclude, the United Nations, something is missing. The United Nations ought to be called the nation of United States. The states we have understood are united to financiarization, to the neoliberal economical system. This is what the United Nations are, and this is proven by the fact that the Special Rapporteur on the right to Husin has to create a movement called SHIFT. my chairman's prerogative to, to kind of bring these three questions together. And I think that the question that possibly all of you are asking in different ways, which is what are the next steps both for you and for the movement? And I'm going to ask each person on the, 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 the panel. Um, Maria Lucia, for you, what are the next steps? Concordo uh, com... I agree with the lady in the audience who said that we need to disseminate information and also to uh, touch people with our message, especially the most vulnerable, so that we can achieve the change we're wishing for. Also, regarding with being naive, of course, we cannot believe that only by signing a document or by enacting a law, we will have change. This is something from our daily lives. We have laws, we have documents that are not implemented. But that's why we need to have a global movement that give, gives voices for the most vulnerable. And I think that's the next step. And that's the work we're doing in Rio de Janeiro, in the Ombudsman office, questioning the system, which is not the ideal system. If the market um, answered uh, or met the needs of our people, we would live in a different world. Therefore, we know that this is not working, and we need, we need to change it. But this change is not easy. It's upon us. It depends on all of us. And sometimes we are in a comfortable situation. We are not directly impacted, but we have a responsibility towards um, our co-citizens. And we need to touch people so that they can move out of the comfort zone. 
and also help uh, those who are hopeless. They live in such a misery that they are unable to give one step forward. And that's why we have a role here, a role such as human rights defenders. And that's why our work is very important. It's important to go out there, dialogue with the communities, um, question the financial system, and why all the financial crises are paid by the poor people while others are getting richer and richer. And this is an unequal world, and it's our job to change it. We would be naive to believe that uh, we would overcome all of our obstacles without putting a fight. I'm aware that it's not an easy task, but we cannot, we cannot stop fighting for human rights, watching uh, this lack of human nature. All this urbanization is taking away our human nature because we are becoming less and less humans and people are focusing more and more on the stock market. I think that's the job we need to do to change it and we we'll change the world. That's what I believe. Thank you. Frederick, we're, we're finishing up here. So yes, I will be really short. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've just made a film, and uh, that's my job. And the cool thing with the film is that this film can be used as a tool for people who want to make change. So if you want to bring the film to your town, to your school, to your workplace, to your, you can do it, and you can talk to people and start to create this new language, the counter language for the other lingo, maybe then you can, you can be part of a change and you can use this film. Very briefly, how do they get your film? Sorry? How do they get your film to show in there? Well, films? they can start to follow us on the social media, push the film on so on, and you can follow me on Twitter and so on, and then you can just ask me and then we'll, we will direct you, we'll find a way. It's not so hard. It's, yeah. Leilani, finishing up now. Mm. You, I'm going, yes, my last thoughts. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep pushing back by growing the shift and by promoting push the film. And I'm going to drink a lot of wine, which is what I think we should all do now. I second Leilani. I think drinking wine is a very good idea. Um, well, this is it. Um, thank you very much for coming. You've been a fantastic audience. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the film. Thanks to Frederick and Leilani for the film. <laughs> Thanks for Ma Maria Lucia, who's come all the way to Brazil, from Brazil to watch the film, which is amazing. And, um, and thank you very much indeed for coming. Good night.